WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are positively taking the Maryland Crab Cake Tour back out on the road. Freakness in town this month. Perfect to get back to State Fair. We'll be in Catonsville next Friday with CFG Bank President Bill Weedell talking about the new arena. All of it brought to you by the Maryland Lottery. I'll be giving away some instant lottery scratch-offs to throw back. It is the 50th anniversary. Be on the lookout for that home run. Rich is on the 50th home run for the Orioles, uh, as well as our friends at Window Nation, 866-90-NATION. I've been waiting to have this guy on. My wife and I ran off to Hawaii and I blew off big stars of the media circuit, but he sent me a book. Two of my favorite things politics and sports together all in the same place i've watched him on cnn for years a pleasure to have a chris saliza on the program for the first time dude i apologize man i was in like canapale or kapalu or some crazy place but i'm so glad that we finally made this happen what a concept for a book power players in the american presidency through sports. yeah thank you thank you for having me yeah I, it's uh, i always say when people ask what the idea of the book was i always say it's selfish i i once I gave up my dream of being in the NBA at about age 14, uh, I realized I had to do something else with my life. So I knew I wanted to go into journalism. I just didn't know what kind. And I always assumed sports because that was what I was most passionate about. But I wound up going down a different route, politics. But I kept sort of the sports fires burning uh, throughout all that time. I always sort of followed for it, sports really closely, was really into it. And so when my editor came to me and said, hey, you know, do you want to write a book? I thought, well, geez, this is daunting. But I wanted to do something that I knew I could be passionate about. So I, I, we, we looked in that hard in that sports and politics space, um, and wound up coming up with, you know, what is the the elevator pitch for the book is effectively the sports presidents played, loved, and spectated, and what it tells us about who they are and how they govern. That's that's sort of the lens that we sought to look through uh, throughout the uh, throughout the book, and I, and I hope did so successfully. It hasn't been hard in our lifetime, right, to find that Obama liked basketball, Trump liked golf, you know, Bush loved baseball, you know, so yep. like and and how that relates to getting elected, maybe to some degree and playing along I mean, Richard Nixon loved baseball, you know, uh, yep. through all of these years um, sport. And I'm a man of competition. I did this at Yale. I did that. You know, all of that went into your manhood to to make you qualified, right? A little bit. Yes, absolutely. Look, I, I mean, I always trace back the roots of sports and politics to Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt believed in sports because he wanted to train, particularly football, because he wanted to train young men for war. Literally, he came out and said it. So it's always been sort of linked into our culture. I would say, I think to your point, sports is a common language a lot of people speak. Uh, politicians need to find ways to reach the average person where they are, right? They need to find ways to uh, identify with them, empathize with them, understand their hopes, their dreams, their fears, their ambitions, all that stuff. Sports is a way to do that. You mentioned Nixon. So Nixon is super awkward as a person, right? He He's not, uh, he's not socially skilled. He's a little bit of a loner. But he uses sports, just being able to sort of talk about the, well, hey, did you see how the Orioles did? Or, you know, what do you think of the AL East this year? He uses that stuff to be able to relate to people in a way he couldn't otherwise. And I think without sports, Richard Nixon probably doesn't wind up being president of the United States because from a purely personality and charisma standpoint, he's very much lagging behind other politicians. But he uses it in ways to associate and and, and get himself closer with people that he would never have been able to do otherwise. Well, it's funny you'd say that because I think there's a really famous debate uh, in black and white and, you know, Jack Kennedy, I, I, in, in thinking about your book and like my journalism and I'm the exact opposite, dude, I've done sports radio here for 31 mm -hmm. years, right? Since before the Ravens existed, how do we get Camden yards built? Oh my God, we lost the Colts, all of that stuff. I've, I've been a part of all of that. And I've turned to politics since Trump got elected and my city was on fire and two of our mayors have gone to jail, like all of these issues that we've had here that it really is sort of interrelated when you see Wes Moore get elected here. And the first mm -hmm. thing he's doing is running around with little John Angelos and and the Bishotti got his stadium deal done with Hogan before Hogan left so you know all these are the billionaires these are the guys these are the guys that pay Lamar Jackson 260 million dollars and we pony up 600 million more dollars to keep the stadiums running and keep mm -hmm. sport going and hey we lost the bullets and we lost the Colts we still have all of that going on we don't have a lease for our baseball team here and the governor is 
is moving around. The new governor, the non-politician governor who might be president one day. I love Wes. But the, one of the first things he's doing is running around on opening day with John Angelo saying, uh, we can't lose the baseball team on my watch. I'm the governor. That'll be on my ass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I think that politicians understand that sports is something that people feel very passionately about. And a lot more people feel more passionately about sports than do about politics. Look, I, as I can tell you from my own experience, there's been lots and lots of people who feel very passionately about politics, right? But people feel even more passionately about sports and more of them do so. So I think somebody asked me recently, do you think a someone could get elected president? And I would put this down to elected governor is probably in the same boat. Do you think they could get elected if they had no knowledge of or interest in sports? And I think the answer to that is no. Um, I think you would really struggle if you, I mean, I always think back to John Kerry in 2004 calling Lambeau Field, Lambert Field, and that being a big deal because it was, you know, some, for some people, it was a stand in for, well, he doesn't get sports. He doesn't get American culture. Um, and so I really do think there's politicians understand that even if you can't, uh, even if you don't really care, you have to fake it. Some of our best, uh, so most well-regarded presidents, Ronald Reagan, for example, was a great faker of a love in sports. He didn't really care about sports beyond Notre Dame football because he had played George Gipp in a movie about Notre Dame football. So he kind of cared about Notre Dame football, but only a little bit. He didn't really watch sports on TV. He wasn't a follower of it. But what did Reagan do? Reagan was the first president to formalize bringing championship teams after they won the Super Bowl, the NBA championship, to the White House. Because he understood that being associated with winners and elite athletes was a good thing for a president of the United States. So I think that you got to be able to fake it, even if you don't actually care. Not every president is going to be Nixon or Bill Clinton, who's like a big fan, right? Who are, who are naturally fans of uh, a sport. But I think you have to be able to at least speak that language. Uh, or I think you would really, really struggle because I think people would view you as out of touch. Whether that's fair or unfair, I think that's the nature of how sports works in our society now. Chris Salez is here. He's written a book, Power Players, Sports, Politics, and the American Presidency. Uh, we waited to have him on. So, you know, I was excited to have you on. You're a couple weeks later than you wanted to be or I wanted you to be. <laughs> and I started thinking, like, I found this picture of Louis Aparicio with JFK in 1962 at the All-Star Game and, and Stan Musial's next to him. Mm -hmm. And then I found old Oriole pictures from the same era with JFK. So we're going back, you know, f 60 years now, right? Yeah. I'm thinking to myself, I've been in sports radio 30 years, and I was going to tell the story in the last time, but... I ran into Bill Clinton. I rubbed elbows with him going to the bathroom in the media level in 94, <laughs> 5, 6, opening day. He's in Baltimore. There's no nationals, and he's here throwing out the first pitch. And I, yep. I, I've I, been invited to the White House twice in my life when the Ravens won the Super Bowl, right? Obama and Bush, and I have a picture with Bush. No picture with Obama. They threw us out on the lawn uh, back in the day. Um, they, they knew where to put journalists. Um, but, I, you know, my sport connection to presidents is I've covered sports, and I've gotten to meet several of them because they want to be up on sports. I'm a journalist and because they wanted the teams at the White House and whatever. And and I, I think about like Obama and basketball and Trump and, and golf. And even in the modern era, there really is no separation of this. I mean, no. in researching this with, with your publisher and doing it, how much did you learn? I mean, yeah, I just Googled a couple of things and I'm like, oh, look at that. Look at that. Yeah. I'm sure this was a hell of a cool project for you. Learning. It was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, again, selfish. Uh, I wanted to know more about it. It was a question I wondered about. I knew some stuff like obviously, like before I started the book, I knew about George W. Bush's first pitch in the 2001 World Series and the Diamondbacks and the Yankees. He comes out after September 11th. He throws a strike. It's a bit like I knew some of the big moments where sports and politics fused, but there were tons of stuff that I didn't know anything about. Like Nixon, I keep coming back to Nixon because I'm fascinated by him, but Nixon bowled, which is really interesting. So back then in the late 60s, and early 70s, bowling was a big deal in this country. Uh, the first person to be sponsored by a company first athlete to be sponsored by a company was a bowler, which is so random. But More than a true. golfer. Really? Yes. Yes. Wow. A bowler. Right. Um, so uh, he had bowling alleys put into the White House, just two, two lanes. And he would go, and this is by his own admission. He told the White House press corps this. I found this. I was totally fascinated by it. He would go at night after 10 o'clock 
he would go and by his own admission would roll between seven and 12 games. Uh, he would bowl that much, which to me is crazy uh, that he would get that involved in bowling. But he did. He said it calmed him down. Uh, he said uh, he enjoyed it. He talked to the press corps about it. He bragged about his bowling score. He said that he shot a 229, uh, which he said included seven strikes, including four in a row. So, like, that I didn't know. I didn't know uh, Donald Trump played squash in college, of all things. So Donald Trump he was a pretty good athlete in high school. He played baseball primarily. But he goes to Fordham for one year, and he plays squash. Uh, I talked to his biographer, a guy named Mark Fisher, who I used to work with at the Washington Post. And Fisher said that Trump was not a great squash player, not because he wasn't a good athlete. He is a pretty good athlete, but because he had he lacked the patience for the sport. So he just wasn't good at playing the subtleties of of squash, sort of playing a couple a couple shots ahead and thinking through like what was his opponent doing and what could he do. He would just get frustrated and just try to bash the ball by them and lose lose points, which I thought was almost too on the nose as it relates to sort of Trump's approach to politics, sort of bash through everyone and throw the subtlety out the window. So there was a ton of stuff like that. I learned a bunch about Eisenhower and his relationship with Augusta, his relationship with Arnie, Arnold Palmer, um, just stuff I I knew a little bit about, but didn't know enough about, about JFK and, and that, how good a golfer he was and how they hid the fact that he was a really good golfer because he had been very critical of Eisenhower for how much Eisenhower played golf. And they didn't want him to look like a hypocrite. They also didn't want him to look like an elitist uh, because he he played a game. You know, he was from a patrician family. His father was an ambassador. There were talk that his father had sort of bought him the, ho the house and the Senate seats. And they didn't want him playing in a, what, a game at that point, at least, was considered an elitist game. So they really downplayed how much he played golf or at least how much he played it publicly and played up the tackle football because they viewed football as a more average Joe game. So yeah, well, it was a Kennedy family game every year on Thanksgiving. Just exactly. ask anyone. We all know. And what's right? what's remarkable is that and by the way, so that may have spawned the NFL over the last 60 years. I, I will they, put to you as a longtime sports guy without Thanksgiving, the, the NFL's own Thanksgiving and Christmas and that that's changed yep. everything for them. Absolutely. And, and the Kennedy thing was all perception. He you know, his back was so bad that for much of his life, he couldn't even play in those pickup uh, touch football games. He, he could barely move around. Uh, but the idea that we all have in our head of Kennedy, if you're of a certain age, is them playing football at Hyannisport, right? Them playing at the compound, um, at the Kennedy compound. Uh, in fact, he was a very mediocre uh, football player. He played for one year at, at Harvard, but he was a really good golfer. But of course, no one really knows that because they made it their business to make sure people didn't know that. Chris Eliza has made it his business to write a book about power players, sports, politics, and the American present. How you been? What's going on, man? Let's let wh who are your teams? Let's start with that because sure. if you want to write this, you have to have tears like the Bruins so, fans lately, or maybe some cheers like our Orioles fans lately. So I grew up Yankees, Ugh. 76ers. I grew up in Connecticut. Yankees, 76ers mostly. And and at the time we had the Hartford Whalers, which was the only pro sports team in Connecticut. They moved to Carolina. I'm hearing brass bananas in my heart right now. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great song. We still, we have some great, we have Ron Francis, Kevin Deneen, and Brass Bonanza. Um, so I grew up that way. I have lived in Washington now for longer than I lived in Connecticut. So, and, and with my kids and the Nationals coming, we are Nationals fans. I think I'm probably a Nationals fan more than anything else. I root for the Wizards, but they've been so bad that it doesn't really, you know, compute. Uh, I'm still a Giants fan, New York Giants fan, left over from my years of, of being in Connecticut. But so mostly, and this is depressing because this is a team, unlike the Orioles, this is a team that is not on the, on the upswing. This is a team mired deep in mediocrity. I'm mostly a Nationals fan. Like, I, if I watch sports i'm mostly watching nationals games which was, is a little bit depressing these days well good good for you you had a parade uh and you know and and and, and one day peter will pay the owner pay, peter will pay the bill for all the tv he's stolen the last 20 bill. years but that, that's enough I, i've written book i've written the peter principles about that speaking of passion projects my last name's aparicio and i've been mired here for 30 years watching this right so <laughs> you know i would say from a sports standpoint everything's sort of a little bit cyclical but Connecticut's 
yeah, not to insult you or your people, it's sort of the eerie of sports. You can do whatever you want, right? You can yes, adopt anything totally. you want when you're in Connecticut, right? I grew up, so I grew up in like South Central Connecticut, and it's it, it was basically split almost evenly between Red Sox and Yankees fans. There were a few Mets fans in there, but not really. Um, and yeah, you can sort of root for you. You want to root for the Jets? You want to root for the Giants? You can root for either one. I, I Most of the people I grew up with were Giants fans, but, you know, this was – it's, it's weird to think about, but this was, you know, let's see, I'm 47. So this is 35 years ago. Football was not as dominant then as it is now. I mean, it was a much bigger deal, whether you rooted for the Yankees or the Red Sox, where I grew up, than if you rooted for the Giants or the Patriots or the Jets. Um, there was a brief time Bob Kraft used Connecticut. He tried to leverage Connecticut, said he was going to move the Patriots to Connecticut. We threw all this money at him, said, speaking of building stadiums. Said we're going to build a stadium. Coming to Hartford, right? They were coming to Hartford. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And then he just used that to leverage more money out of Foxborough. So that was depressing. So that we, I definitely did not and still do not root for the Patriots for that reason. But, yeah, it, it's funny when I think back because I remember watching every Yankee game on WPIX. It was Bill White doing uh, color, doing the play-by-play and Phil Rizzuto doing the commentary. Scooter. Which was a, a, great, a great booth uh, to grow up with. The Yankees at the time were horrendous. One of the leading memories of my childhood is Andy Hawkins pitched a no hitter and the Yankees lost three, nothing. So, I mean, they had Don Mattingly who I worshiped. They had Dave Winfield. You were there during um, the Ed Witts and uh, Don Mattingly. Exactly. Yeah, Matt- I, I, Mattingly was a big star and, and Winfield was a big star, but they were not very good. Sort of mid eighties was my wheelhouse for the Yankees. So angry everyone George. always says angry right. tabloid George. Yes. Everyone says like, Oh, Yankee fan front runner. I'm like, well, I, they were not good when I was a Yankee fan. I should have stuck with them because obviously they got good again. But by then I had moved here and was sort of rooting for the nationals. Um, but yeah, that's my journey. I mean, I've I've always loved sports. It's always been a thing I've been passionate about. Uh, and I think it's really, it was a really cool experience to not just, what I didn't want to do with the book was just write a like partisan political book. There's enough of those out there. Uh, I just felt like, you know, I, I personally was worn out from all the partisanship I had spent the last five years at CNN covering Trump. And so I wanted to write a book that, was about politics it's about american presidents obviously it's about politics but not political and not polarizing and so sports was a really great way to get into that because even people who don't want to talk to you about like the obama presidency will talk to you about obama's you know the pickup games they played and why he's interested in basketball and whether he's good or not and that got me into talk to a lot of people that i think probably wouldn't have talked to me if i was doing a purely political book Crystalis is here. We have uh, not stuck to sports too much in this segment. The book is Power Players, Sports, Politics, and the American Presidency. Uh, and enough of bipartisanship right there on the front page, including the <laughs> Rathlin ring uh, with the Rathlin president. Um, anything you have to say about the current state of the state? And I'll give you a couple minutes to stretch out because I do love – I'd love to – listen, and this is my cheap shot for you. If you, you want to see some real baseball, this, you come up to Baltimore, I get your crab cake. I know. Home. We're nearby. I know. But, but Don't on, I know it. Yeah, but but on to the political scene. I mean, we have a really interesting landscape here in Maryland on the Democratic side. Anybody who listens to me knows I had no use for Trump or any of the lies or any. I'm a media member, all of that stuff. But we have a Democratic state now that's really been very purple and, quite frankly, was run red uh, right out of the red line through my city uh, eight years ago. Um, it's a fascinating time in Maryland and certainly for Westmore. Yeah, Westmore is so. I, I think the last two governors of Maryland have been very interesting. So Larry Hogan is a guy without sort of a party at this point. You know, I think I think in the Republican Party of twenty years ago, Larry Hogan is a really interesting voice, right? He's a guy who's had success in what a, you know. It, we can debate Maryland or Massachusetts, which is the most Democratic state, but it's probably one of the two of those. Uh, to elect a Republican governor, to reelect a Republican governor. Like Larry Hogan would have a really cool and interesting story to tell on the national level 20 years ago in the Republican Party. The problem is it's not 20 or 30 years ago in the Republican Party. It's today. And I think he very much, you know, I think him not running for president in 2024 is just a bowing to reality, right? There's just no lane for someone like him, a moderate Republican who- There was no is, lane here. Yeah, Four years right. later, like I had Barry right. Glassman on two weeks ago on the Crab Cake Tour up in Harford County. I mean, just no lane unless you want to 
wrap yep. yourself in a Trump flag Trump. and a red hat. Yep. And, yep. and I, I would, I mean, Ehrlich went that direction big time. And he and I had some conversations about that after I endorsed him 20 years ago, uh, which is a political embarrassment to me, quite frankly, all these years later, but it, at least they haven't signed up for it, but it doesn't make him a viable candidate. I don't know if it makes him a viable no. senatorial candidate. And by the no. way, I should bring this up with you since you have a little political book. Cal Ripken's name's been brought up with Senator. I right? saw that. <laughs> I saw that they mentioned Cal as a, I think, look, I think if you're a Republican, in, in Maryland, you're not in a great place. So you basically have Larry Hogan and Cal Ripken. So as soon as those two things happened, as soon as Ben Cardin announced he was retiring, they went to those two guys and said, would you consider running? Both said no, which, by the way, is the smartest thing both of them could have done. I don't think Larry Hogan could win a Senate race uh, in, in uh, Maryland. Federal races are very different. There's a reason that Maryland has had a Republican governor, Massachusetts has had a Republican governor, Kansas and Oklahoma have had Democratic governors, because you can get elected in a state race because you don't have to answer for the national party. In a federal race, like a Senate race, you have to answer for the national party. It becomes so much more difficult. We've seen uh, popular governor after popular governor, it just happened in Montana a few years ago, popular Democratic governor runs for Senate, loses overwhelmingly. It just, it, it doesn't work. So smart decision by Larry Hogan. And if you're Cal, there's absolutely no reason to run for office, none. And unless you have a burning desire that's always been there to run, which I don't think he does. Um, Wes Moore, like, like the way Herschel Walker did, as an example. Yeah, I don't know about that, man. I, I mean, Dude, I, 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 I you was, wrote the book on sports and politics and why they're running, you know, cl literally clown, clown, clown candidates. And we, we got a former football ball coach sitting in D.C. down the street from you, right? Running things. It's... I would. I, it's interesting to me. I would be interested to give Herschel Walker a lie detector test and ask if if he could do it over again if he would run. I I, I genuinely am skeptical he would because I don't think that was an experience that he particularly enjoyed and 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 he was not made to be a candidate. Anyone who watched that that race knew this is a guy who's uncomfortable on the campaign trail, not a great public speaker, all, all of these things. But he was Herschel Walker, so he won the primary because he's a legend in Georgia. And then, you know, he came relatively close to winning the general election. Anyway, back to Maryland. Uh, yeah, Wes Moore is a really interesting guy. I mean, I've known him for a while. He's been kicking around politics for a while uh, prior to running for governor. Um, I think he is someone who is going to be mentioned in 2028 uh, if Biden wins uh, or if Biden loses. Uh, he is someone who's going to be mentioned in 2028 as a national candidate. I, I think he will go down the road of um, at least exploring that, right? Like uh, uh, talking to people nationally, going to Iowa, going to New Hampshire. Um, he'll be doing that right around the time that he, 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 I, this is presuming he gets reelected in 2026 to a second term. It's, it, who knows? It's Maryland. I think the Democrat has a huge advantage. I guess he could get primary, and I don't think it's likely an incumbent Democratic governor is going to lose a primary in Maryland. Um, but I do think Westmore is someone who we will hear of in the sort of Pete Buttigieg, uh, Kamala Harris conversations about 2028 as people start looking beyond Biden. I think you're already seeing some of that now where people are saying, OK, well, the 2024 race is going to be Biden versus Trump. But what about who's the fresh face on the Republican side? Who's the fresh face on the Democratic side? I think Wes Moore is in that space, and that's a very good place to be. Now, some of that depends on how he governs, right? If, if he is viewed as a terrible governor, then you lose some of the luster of running for president. But if he has a good first term, if he's reelected by a decent margin in 2026, I could see that being a launching pad for a presidential race, because unlike Larry Hogan, Wes Moore's politics fit within the current iteration of the Democratic Party. What are the Democrats doing running Biden and what are the Republicans doing running Trump? I mean, yeah. there's sort of a little um, bit of insanity to both of these things. And I'm a guy that, you know, I, I voted for Biden. I'm good with it, but I don't need 80 year old guys running the country, you know? Yeah. So I think with Trump, it's a little bit easier in that they just can't stop it. Um, you know, it, it, it's not as though the establishment has sort of um, bequeathed that Donald Trump be the, the the nominee. I think they've just realized that it's very unlikely they're going to stop him. So some of them at least are getting on board. It's why you see some of these members of Congress endorsing him now, because it's like, well, if he's going to win, I might as well be on now and maybe get something in the administration as opposed to not. Uh, with Biden, um, I think at least in part, it's a lack of a, an alternative. So the two people running against him are Robert F. Kennedy Jr., no, sort of no, obviously a name people know, the the uh, 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 related to the he he is John Kennedy's uh, 
Well, let's see. RFK is his dad. So he's that's he and John were obviously nephew. brothers and R, he's his nephew. Of course, I can't there think of a word. That, that's um, fine. I mean, you're trying to piece together all so, sorts of things, Chris. So he's he's an anti-vaxxer and I think has become known as that nationally. Um, and then Marianne Williamson, who ran in, in 2020 to really no great regard. Um, you know, Gavin Newsom isn't running. Wes Moore isn't running. Uh, Kamala Harris isn't running. Pete Buttigieg isn't running. Um, and so I think when it's for Biden, it's look at the alternatives. He was successful in keeping other people out of the race who would be potentially damaging to him. So, yeah, I do, even though every poll suggests people don't want this race. It's, I think that we are getting Biden versus Trump uh, in 2024. Could Trump lose the primary? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, he's very unpredictable. Things could go wrong for him. At the same time, I feel like the support he has is very much locked in uh, and is unlikely to move all that much. It, it hasn't moved in, in all these years. I don't think it's likely. I don't know what you could find out about Donald Trump if you were supporting him. What you could find out about him now that would make you say like, oh, wow, actually, let me reconsider my past support. So I'm skeptical that anyone other than Trump wins the Republican primary. And I think that Biden will definitely win the Democratic primary. And then in the general election, I think Democrats are a little too optimistic that they're going to win um, easily. I, I think Trump is has a very decent chance of, of winning the general election and becoming president again. Here's Chris Saliza. I've got to let him go. He's got a book. You should go check it out. Maybe for a Father's Day gift, Mother's yes. Day gift, Power Players, uh, Sports, Politics, and the American Presidency. Crab Cake Offer is open. We're 40 miles apart. If you want to come see yeah. some baseball up here, we have the best player in the NFL. Just ask the payroll. Uh, so we have, <laughs> and, and you, you, you might get a new owner down there, and it might bring the football relevance back. But uh, really a pleasure. I've watched you for years. Pleasure to have you on. And great to make your acquaintance. Thanks for time. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You got a Chris Eliza joining us here. We're going to be doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour at State Fair on Friday. We got Preakness going on. We got all sorts of things. All of it brought to you by the Maryland Lottery in conjunction with our friends at Win. Donation. I am Nestor. We are WNST AM 1570 Towson, Baltimore, and we never stop talking. Baltimore, positive.